The man who would come to be known as Augustus was born Gaius Octavius Thorinus on the 23rd day of September in the year 63 BCE. His father was also Gaius Octavius, and his mother was Attia. The younger Octavius was related to a rising star in Roman politics named Julius Caesar, who was elected praetor that same year. Gaius's father died when he was just four years old, leaving him in the care of Julia, the sister of Julius Caesar. The young Gaius, because of his proximity to wealth, received a high-quality education. He immediately displayed his intelligence and potential for leadership. While in school, he met another boy named Marcus Agrippa, who was about the same age. The two became fast friends. In 46 BCE, when Gaius and Marcus were both 17, they decided to seek glory by fighting in the legions. Together they signed up to go with Julius Caesar on his campaign to win his final civil war in Spain. Agrippa fought with the army, impressing Caesar. Despite being bedridden for much of the expedition, Octavius also impressed Caesar with his initiative and intelligence. Caesar spent a while getting to know his great nephew. It is likely that Caesar was one of the only people to fully appreciate the boy's incredible potential. As a reward for their service, Caesar agreed to send Gaius and Marcus to study together in Illyria. The two were in Apollonia in 44 BCE when they got the news. The great dictator Caesar was dead, stabbed by assassins in the Senate. Word was that Octavius had gotten the lion's share of Caesar's inheritance and had been adopted as his son. Octavian's life was now tied to the legacy of Caesar. He was 18 years old, and all of Rome was within his reach. After crossing the Adriatic Sea and waiting in the south of Italy for a few months, Octavius arrived in Rome to a chaotic situation. Caesar's assassins had been run out of the city, and Caesar's old lieutenant Marcus Antonius was holding power along with another general, Marcus Lepidus. Also a powerful player was Marcus Tullius Cicero, famous politician, writer, and public speaker. Antony and Cicero were not on good terms. Some of Cicero's most famous speeches, the Philippics, were delivered as scathing denunciations of Antony that seriously hurt his public image. In order to reinforce his power, Cicero met with Octavius, and the two became allies. Cicero became Octavius's biggest public supporter, and the two opposed Antony, driving him out of Rome. Cicero had the Senate declare Octavius the true heir of Caesar, leading the young man to take on the name of his adoptive father, Gaius Julius Caesar. History, however, starts now to call him Octavian. Unfortunately for Cicero, Octavian unexpectedly betrayed him. Secret negotiations with Antony and Lepidus resulted in the formation of a new alliance, known as the Second Triumvirate. Under this agreement, the three would work together to defeat Caesar's killers, who were massing troops under the banner of the Liberators in Greece. First, though, the three dictators of Rome had to cover their bases. They launched a series of execution orders for their political enemies. Antony wanted Cicero's head and hands nailed onto a board and displayed in the forum. After days of vigorous debate, each of the three men sacrificed someone they wished to protect. For Octavian, that man was Cicero, and his head and hands ended up in the forum as a grim warning to those who would oppose the new authority. Hundreds were killed in this political purge, with Octavian taking the initiative in brutality and cruelty. In 42 BCE, the combined forces of Mark Antony and Octavian defeated the combined liberator army at Philippi in Greece. Brutus and Cassius 
the two ringleaders of the original conspiracy, both ended up dead. The death of Caesar was finally avenged. Shortly after, Antony sailed off to Egypt, where he would spend the next decade in an affair with its famous queen, Cleopatra. Meanwhile, Octavian went back to Italy. He spent the next few years consolidating his position, including defeating a revolt in gruesome fashion by executing over 300 senators in cold blood. At this stage in his career, Octavian was not at all shy of using terrible force and committing atrocities for political purposes. He also brought his friend Marcus Agrippa onto his staff. Agrippa quickly became his right-hand man. In spite of his brutal methods, the people of Rome came to love him. When the grain supplies from North Africa and Sicily were blockaded by the rebellious Sextus Pompey, him and Agrippa waged war on land and sea to defeat Pompey and restore the food supplies. Led by Agrippa, Octavian's fleets won decisive battles and rid the Mediterranean of piracy. Octavian funded circuses and games to celebrate his victory and the return of food. Gradually, Rome accepted him as the legitimate ruler and listened to everything bad he had to say about Mark Antony, who was still uh, occupied in the East. After successfully slandering and attacking Mark Antony, Octavian convinced the people of Rome that Antony was an enemy of Rome and needed to be destroyed. They cheered him and Agrippa as they sailed off to the east. Once again, a fleet led by Agrippa dealt the decisive blow to Mark Antony's power, defeating him and Cleopatra at Actium in 31 BCE. After a brief battle in Alexandria, Antony and Cleopatra both committed suicide and after a brief stay in Egypt, Octavian sailed back to Rome in 30 BCE. He was now effectively the sole ruler of Rome. The first thing for Octavian to do was celebrate. Octavian celebrated three triumphs, one for Illyricum, one for Actium, and one for Alexandria. Octavian damned the memory of Mark Antony. Among other things, like destroying Antony's statues, he decreed that no future son of the Antonius clan could be named Marcus. Octavian and Agrippa also successfully demobilized the oversized legions of the civil wars. Half of the legions were disbanded, leaving the Roman army at a reasonable size and giving the veterans productive land to settle on. Previous generals had trouble with paying their soldiers, but because of his vast wealth, Octavian had money to pay them all. Through a series of agreements with the Senate, Octavian permanently solidified his position within the Roman state. The Senate awarded him the powers of a tribune and a censor for life, a range of authority which allowed him to operate without holding elected office. He also had total authority over several key provinces, which together had the majority of Rome's legions. This made him, in effect, a military dictator. The Senate also awarded him two more titles. Princeps, first citizen, and Augustus, the revered one. He was very careful not to be a king, as the Romans hated kings. He did not want to show himself as above the common Roman. As princeps, he was merely the first among equals. Essentially, Augustus quietly seized power within the Republic and made its democratic elements irrelevant. However, he was not simply a power-hungry fool who wanted power for its own sake. Once he had secured his power, he was a very benevolent ruler. A 
Augustus reformed the tax system. During the Republic, private companies were contracted to collect taxes from the provinces, which resulted in a lot of abuse. Augustus brought taxes under the control of the central government, making the system more fair and efficient. For the first time, Augustus established police and firefighting departments in Rome. The streets would be safer at night, as would the property of citizens from fire. Augustus embarked on a campaign of building projects unprecedented in Roman history. He built his own forum in Rome, complete with a massive temple to Mars. He also commissioned tens of thousands of miles of roads and numerous courier stations across the empire. Rome was more connected than ever to its provinces. His efforts resulted in the construction of bridges, aqueducts, and other public works around the empire. He restored and rebuilt so many buildings in Rome that the city was forever transformed. As his famous quote goes, I found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. For all of his accomplishments, Augustus was not a perfect ruler, and he had his shortcomings. His failure to find a desirable successor to inherit his unique position was not for lack of trying. He ran through countless heirs as they all fell victim to tragedy. In the end, he had to settle for his last choice in Tiberius, who, while competent, was not who Augustus wanted. Perhaps Augustus's most famous failure came in 9 CE, when three legions under Publius Quinctilius Varus were wiped out in the Teutoburg Forest while on campaign to subjugate Germany. This loss represented 10% of the entire Roman army, a loss which was not easily replaced. Reportedly, upon hearing news of the defeat, Augustus panicked, did not shave for months, and would repeatedly yell out, Quinctilius Varus, give me back my legions. Augustus did not want to accept it, but after this, Rome would never conquer Germania. One day, from that very same region Rome once failed to conquer, Germanic tribes would move across the borders and destroy the old Roman world. In the summer of 14, Augustus fell ill and retreated to his country villa in Nola. He knew it was his time to go. Without any fanfare, he said some last words to his closest friends and advisors. Have I played my part well? Then applaud as I exit the stage. Then, with only his wife by his side, he died. He was 75 years old, and had ruled Rome as emperor for 40 years. What are we to make of Augustus? He was essentially a military dictator, maintaining an iron grip on the military and influencing all aspects of the political system. In his early days, he was brutal with his political repressions, killing hundreds of senators he dealt the final blow to the ailing Roman Republic. And however much he tried to deny it, he effectively became a king. But if he was truly a king, he was a benevolent and wise king who did great things for Rome. He built aqueducts and roads, bringing clean water to cities and connecting communities. He made the empire a safer place by establishing a police and firefighting force. He consolidated the empire's borders to make them defensible for centuries. He was intently focused on the public good 
and on the good of Rome, working day and night in every way he could to ensure the survival of the Roman Empire. All future emperors of Rome would use his name, Augustus, as an imperial title. His influence is indisputable. And although he remains a controversial figure today, I'm sure that's exactly what he would have wanted. He deserves to be one of the people that, so long after they're gone, we still struggle to understand. Thank you.